random character weaknesses, this is a good person, you know, that's not what we need to hear about. But, you know, I've had trials last, you know, uh, you know, a few minutes, it may just be arguments. Um, this is how I see the case versus how the department sees the case. We can't, you know, we can't come to an agreement. Or, you know, in the worst case, I had a trial at this stage last more than six months. So I want you to be aware, when we have that initial filing, it's 30 days or something like that, when we get that first report, but the parents can set that for trial. That trial is likely to be set about a month later. And at that point, we're still looking at what are we dealing with. So you may have had that child in your care for two months, and we still don't know what the case plan is. We still don't know what is found to be true. We're still in this place. And at this stage, I mentioned to you in the beginning that the standard of proof is at, at the beginning stage is just bare minimum. It bumps up here. Okay, at this point, it's called uh, preponderance of the evidence. That means more likely than not. Okay, a reasonable person looking at this evidence, is this likely what happened? Not just like we think so, it's not speculative. And it's not beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like you see in criminal cases, it's not like absolutely this must be true. But this is generally what we think happened. Part two, disposition. So the second piece of this, these can be combined hearings or these can be separate hearings. Part of the hearing, the initial um, allegations can be settled and this part two can be set for context. So now we have disposition. What we're looking at here, as it says above, is given what's true, what are we gonna do about it? What does the court want to do? What do the parties need to do? And at this stage, again, placement becomes an issue. So you may have allegations agreed to and the parents are still arguing to have that child go home. They may say, you know what, in that month, I've gotten in some programs, I've attended five parenting classes, I'm going to counseling, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. This is their opportunity to say, I'm ready for my child to be home. And so they can also set this piece for trial. And it's important because the standard of proof, even though this is sort of a combined hearing at the disposition, which is the case plan, what are we gonna do about it, bumps up a little further. At this point, we have a standard that's clear and convincing evidence. And, and essentially that also is that the department may show, must show by clear and convincing evidence that the child cannot be safely maintained in the home. They have to show evidence of detriment, okay? so. What this means, and what that means as opposed to more likely than not, you're looking at more than 51%, you're looking at like 75, 80%. You're looking at, this is strong evidence. Not beyond shadow of a doubt, not like, you, know, you look at these criminal cases and you think for sure, you know, you look at law, oh, this person's guilty, 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 right? But there's a possible shred that this person can be, could be innocent. That's not what we're looking at here, okay? We're not looking at that shred. We're looking at pretty strong evidence, but not, no escape hatch. You know, I don't know if that's, that's helpful. That's kind of a way to understand it as a, as a general term. We're also supposed to put in the case plan. Case plan is supposed to be specifically tailored. That means we're supposed to look at how you can really um, help this family. As a practical matter, you're looking at counseling, parenting classes, maybe domestic violence classes, maybe classes for sexual abuse perpetrators or, or, or victims, or awareness. They kind of have a cookie cutter formula that ends up happening with these cases. and. It's unfortunate, but that's but the the law states that they're supposed to be specifically tailored. There is an ability for the county, for, for example, to provide an in-home um, a parent uh, partner or someone to come in the home in-home services to show them how to do in-home homemaking. Do they know how to keep a clean home? They can come out and demonstrate things like that that you never imagine that they have the services. They do exist, but um, you know more likely than not, you're going to look at just counseling services. Um, I mentioned in the child welfare, okay, reasonable services. Oh wait, let me back up. Okay, incarcerated parents are entitled to services, even though they may not have access, um, unless they're gonna be incarcerated for too long. If they have a sentence of uh, more than the reunification period, I'll just leave it that way, then they may not be offered services. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Reasonable services, the, the, the department has a goal, uh, duty to provide reasonable services. They can't just throw some referrals to the parent, here's some paperwork, go find a class, uh, try to help them. That happens a lot, that's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to actually try to help them. Um, Indian Child Welfare Act, I put that here as to say that there's a, um, what you hear in the typical case of the department is supposed to provide reasonable services. If you have an ICFL case, they're supposed to provide active efforts. In practical matter, matters, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Reasonable services should be active efforts. However, they, it can be used as a term to say you need to go beyond that. You need to go to the next level, okay? 
Uh, services for the children. What does the child need? Does the child need therapy? What about schooling? Do they need um, uh, hands-on parenting for the mother and the child or, or father and the child? Do they have? Uh, do they need? Sometimes you need medication if they have medical needs or other needs. You know what? You know we need to look at what the child needs and then visitation. This is a big one. The child and parents have a right to visit during this period. As I mentioned, reunification is what the goal here is. And visitation, visitation is the most important component of the case plan. If a parent is attending their, child, their classes and not visiting the child, that is not a good thing. If they are visiting the child regularly, showing attention, they're having quality visits, and they haven't enrolled in their classes, the court may give them more time. Say, so, you know what, they're bonded and dedicated. I know they haven't enrolled their parent class, but you know what, they're having a hard time. They lost their job, they didn't have transportation, they didn't, you know, whatever barriers they may say gave them trouble. But you know what, you see them there at that visit every week, every twice a week, they love that child, we're getting positive reports on the visits. Be aware that visitation is critical. At this stage, the court can order the visits to be monitored, or unmonitored, or therapeutic. Therapeutic visits are to where a therapist is there present for the visit, and it's, it, it, it is really only ordered in cases of, that are pretty severe, okay? They can also order the visits to take place in a neutral setting at the, at the Department of Children and Family Services office. There's certain criteria there. And the court can decide whether the social uh, worker has authority to alter visits or not. And you're gonna see different, this is gonna be judge specific, courtroom specific. Do they wanna give that, that social uh, worker authority to liberalize visits or not? Some judges want that case to come back. They order monitored visits and say, if you want to make them unmonitored, come back to court and we'll decide. Other judges say, go ahead and liberalize. If the parents are making progress, give them unmonitored visits. You can give them overnights. You can give them weekends. I've had judges say, you can return the job without coming back to court. So I, all they, they can kind of delegate that authority to the social worker as much as they want to. Or they'll say, okay, you can give the child up to overnight visits, but if you're going to return the child, walk the case on. Let me take a look at it. So you, they can actually delegate that, and you may have a judge that gives a lot of authority to the social worker, and you may have a judge that gives a tight rein. And it really just depends on the judge and what they see in their experience, whether they've been burned, whether they trust, I mean, and, and you have a variety of social workers. And you have social workers who will, who have the authority to liberalize the visitation and won't do it. They want to come back to court. So you have the judge, depends on what authority they give. Then you have the social worker that depends on whether they want to exercise that authority. So they may have the right to liberalize visitation, but they don't feel comfortable with it. They want to come back to court. And you have the parents saying, well, the judge said you can make a choice. And the social worker says, no, the judge needs to make a choice. And it may be in the minute order. It may say that the social worker has this discretion, and the social worker is just not comfortable. And they wait to come back to court. And, and the parents may say, well, you know, I, I was in court. The judge said you could decide this. And the social worker says, no, we'll go back to court. You know, it just, it, it just, there's a lot of gray here, so be aware of that. Okay, bypass. I'll talk about this real quickly, and then we'll, but, oh wait, well this is just the flow chart of the alpha disposition, as you can see. Um, FM review, family maintenance, that's when the child's home. So like I said, the, the parents can argue for that, or the child, or anyone can argue to go home, um, versus going into care. There's also some mechanisms up here that uh, talk about other means, that you can, the court can dismiss this case and say, you know what, go service this case, if there's a problem, come back. Things like that. In cases that don't really rise to the level of needing that court supervision. So there's a lot of other bubbles here that aren't going to be the case that you're really dealing with. Um, they can also choose to appoint a guardian right this stage. If the parents don't want services, they have a family member that's appropriate. Uh, you know what, I can't, maybe a medical condition, I can't take care of the child anymore, they can just go. Um, okay, otherwise we go into a six month review. There's a method here for bypass. Bypass is important to understand because these are the fast track cases. Social worker may tell you, I'm going to let you read all of these things, and I'm going to go to the next slide. The most important one is prior failed cases and we're about to know. So you have a case where, I mean, we had a case come in the other week that, I think it was the 11th baby born addicted to drugs to this mother, and so at that point, the social worker's gonna say that they may have been offered services for babies one through five, one through 10, that this mother is still using. This child is positive tox. We don't need to offer this parent any more services. Now, but I'm gonna tell you what's important to note here is that the social worker will make a recommendation <coughs> Give the parties notice, but the mother can still argue, anyone can argue, for the court. The court is the one who decides whether you're gonna bypass. So if you have a child placed in your home, this is a fast track baby, this mother's not gonna get services, this father's not gonna get services, be aware of a couple things. 
Maybe this is the 11th drug baby to this to this child, to the mother, but maybe this dad has never had a case before. Maybe mom has, you know, found a new partner who has an okay background and, you know, they met in a bar or whatever. You never know what the story is with this case. And I've seen it only a couple times, but I've seen it where this mom comes in and she has had children before, she has failed before, and yet she is now in an inpatient program. She is testing clean. She is visiting that child. And the court, you know, reminds you, this is a couple months in. When we get to the stage where it's at disposition, we're at that case plan, which might have been a couple months in, you can have that mother come in and say, you know what, I know I have a horrible history, but I've seen the light. I've changed. And the judge, if they see that evidence, is probably going to give that mother another chance. They don't have to. But most judges will say, okay, let's give you six months and see what you can do. Because they, they think it's best for the child. Okay, after that, we're looking at the review hearings, okay? These are three possible hearings. The court has to see the case every six months. Three possible things can happen at that time. You can return the child to the parents, continue services, terminate services. Let's look at those real quickly. I want to let you know that at this point, the child, the legal standard is the child must be returned home unless substantial risk of detriment exists, okay? So the preference, the presumption, is to return the child. However, be aware if that parent is not participating in, in visits, not participating in programs, that's evidence that they haven't addressed the issue, okay? So the, if the parent's not in programs, the parent is not visiting, and there is, um, then there's, oh, 30, oh my goodness. Okay, let's move quicker. Um, continue services, if you think you can return the child later, we move on or terminate. Um, what evidence is considered? The court, this, this stage can also be separate trial. So parents can introduce additional evidence. We have the social group report as a primary piece of evidence. Parents can produce evidence. Witnesses can be brought back right in. So you can have a case where the six month review hearing is not heard for trial until six months later. So be aware that parents can also buy extra time this way. Um, how you can help, you can provide information to the, the child's attorney and to the, the social worker. If you are monitoring visits, how are those visits going? If the child is going to visits and coming back and dirty and having problems or having nightmares or whatever it is, speak up, give that information. We need that information. Um, and you can attend, you have a right to come. You do not have to. A lot of times, yeah, you know, the social worker may discourage you from coming. There's no problem with you coming if you're interested in the process. You don't have to, and there's no reason, but if you, if you wanna know what's going, you can come. These, these hearings are available to you. At this time, like I said, the review hearings have happened every six months. The primary issue here is can this child go home? If not, what's next? Okay? Um, and like I said, it can be set. And, it, and, for, for, um, and at this point, the court can also decide to liberalize visit. I mentioned earlier the social worker may have control or the court may have control. So maybe you have a child that's a uh, family that's made some progress but we're not ready to return the child. They can say, okay, let's have a monitored visit. Let's take the next step. How much time do parents have? Parents, um, uh, there's a different standard for kids that are young, under three, they're given six months. Over, over three, 12 months, it's a year. And it says our sibling group, so if you have a child in the family group, you have a one-year-old and a four-year-old and a six-year-old. That can be considered a sibling group where they only get six months. The reality is a lot of judges, if the parent is, is making some progress, it's still gonna give them that 12 months. 12 months is pretty easy to come by. Uh, the parent has to be not visiting, doing nothing, then they'll terminate the services. That's usually what we're looking at. Um, and this is sort of the review hearing that shows you in your chart that it can't, at six months, services can be terminated, and then we're looking for permanency. At, or it can move to 12 months, which is pretty common, or it can terminate. Then there's a couple of exceptional circumstances where the court services can extend to 12, 18 months, and even 24 months. 24 months is really rare. You're talking about a partially parent who just got out. You're talking about a, a, a parent who's in a mental health hospital, things like that. Um, 18 month services, the important piece to note here is that if a parent goes up to 18 months, at that point, the court has a new duty to return the child. If a parent has lasted that long, rather than having to show risk of detriment, the, the statute says that the court shall return unless risk is shown. So rather than, so you got to, so if, you're, if, if, you, if you've had that child 18 months in your care, you may have been caring for that child day in and day out for 18 months, and all of a sudden, 
The presumption is to return that child and move the other. Okay? Okay, variables affecting cases, you have all the parties and, other, and X factors. So you have the personalities. How does this parent present in court? Are they likable? Are they convincing? You have a social worker. Do they believe in this family or not? They can write a report where the parent's doing nothing and they can appear great. You may read this report and say, this parent is not that great. And they train to make their own arguments. And you have a lot of gray here. This is essentially like their own fiefdom. You have a judge that can, you have judges that are very pro-parent. You have judges that have no patience for parents. And there is really a lot of discretion here as to what's going to happen. So be aware of that as well. And the county worker may tell you something. I've written a report. This is what's going to happen at the hearing. The county social worker is not the decision maker. Okay? Be aware that they say, oh, these parents are not going to get their child back. Well, you know what? They're still going to get monitor visits. The judge may have a different view, and the judge is the decision maker, okay? That's really important to know because workers often feel like they have a lot of power, and they do. However, they do not have all the power. Okay, the moment you've been waiting for potentially, what if parents fail to reunify? They don't comply. They're doing nothing. At this point, the, the focus of the court shifts to permanency. At this point, the presumption is what is best for this child to keep uh, safe and stable. We're not looking to support the parents anymore. At this point, it's all about what is good for this child. What is the best plan? At this point, the court needs to choose that plan. Adoption is the legislative preference. So if this child is deemed adoptable, the court will look to find an adopted home for that child if the child is not already placed in one. Um, notice. Notice is important only because these parents have got to know terminating parental rights has a high standard of notice. They may have to publish. They may have to publish notice in a newspaper. They may have to do they have to do a due diligence search for parents. You sometimes have parents that have not shown up for 18 months show up to this termination hearing out of the blue. And they have a right to be there. They may not have done anything. If they're not visiting, it's not going to change anything. Okay? They're not visiting, they're not doing the programs, it's not going to change anything. But they have a right to know that this child is being legally removed. Um, adoptability, the child, the child must be uh, able to be adopted. You have some children that are not that way. At this point, the court looks to terminate parental rights. If the child is adoptable and there's notice, then that's what is, then, then the court will terminate parental rights. That means that there's no legal uh, relationship between the biological parents and the child anymore. But be aware that this is a place that um, if a child 12 and older objects, the court will not adopt that child. <coughs> And exceptions. There are a few exceptions in the law where parents can talk about parental bond, sibling bond, that outweighs their interest in adoption. Okay? And I'm going to say one quick thing about the adoptive home study. The adoptive home study, which all of you will probably go through, does not have to be approved for the court to, to terminate parental rights. However, almost every judge will want to have that adoptive home study approved before they will terminate parental rights. The reason being, you don't want to see illegal orphans. Something goes wrong with that form, well, that, excuse me, something goes wrong with the adoptive home study, you have a child there with no legal parent, no adoptive home, and they're just floating out there with no legal connection. And I have, there have been children, they used to do that, they used to terminate, and then problems happen. So now they really do want to see that home study approved. At, um, I'm going to, de facto parent status and prospective adoptive parent finding, once parental rights, let me talk about prospective adoptive parent quickly, once parental rights have been terminated, the court should designate you as a prospective adoptive parent. What that means is that you are likely the person to adopt this child. If for any reason this child is removed from your home at this stage of the game, once parental rights are determined, you have a right to a hearing. Okay? Doesn't happen often, but it can happen. The fact of parent status, I will talk to you about this if you have interest in this. This is a whole other area. Essentially, the court doesn't usually want the fact of parent status unless parental rights have been terminated. If you're in reunification, you can apply, okay? And the agency may encourage you to apply, but most judges do not want to award that status while you're in reunification service. However, once criminal rights are terminated, then the court should designate you as a prospective adoptive parent, which has more rights than the faculty <coughs> parent status. The faculty parent status gives you a right to attend hearings, get notice. But as a foster parent provider, you can do that anyway. So I'm not discouraging you from that, but most of the time, the court will just view it as a meddling mechanism. It's not helpful. 
but we'll talk about that. Um, let me just uh, get through this real quickly. Pending fi uh, finalization permanency hearings are held every six months. The court's going to look at that case, just like review, to see 